I'm going to bring up my panelists now. I'm doing double duty. Uh, and we're going to uh, have a different format, I think, than I've seen before, and that is I'm going to present in very rapid-fire order 10 propositions that have to do with putting climate change and democracy and democracy in the climate action. And then we're going to have just a freewheeling conversation, no formal presentations, and I thank my panelists for agreeing to that, a, a freewheeling conversation about these propositions. Are they right? Are they wrong? And especially, what new can we do, having tried so many things? Is there something new we can do? So as they get settled, I'm going to start. Our position one is that we are already having a climate majority in this country. Contrary to the title of this presentation, the majority exists. Our challenge is to mobilize it. Proposition two is that in order to mobilize it, we need to raise climate change on the menu of issues that people talk about. Virtually every poll that presents people with prioritization shows climate change at the bottom. Proposition three is that unless we stop climate change, the issue is not going to be what's sustainable, it's going to be what's survivable. Proposition four, state and local action is critical and states and localities deserve a great deal of praise for picking up the ball on the Paris Agreement, but we can't let Congress off the hook. Don't think for a moment that federal action is not necessary. Proposition five, the commitment to climate action is more important than a person's political affiliation. I would argue whether it's an independent Democrat, a Republican socialist, I don't care if they commit to doing something in these next few years about climate change. Proposition six, in 2018 and 20, those elections, climate change needs to be a pass-fail issue. We should not be voting for anyone who does not commit and does it specifically to aggressive climate action. Proposition seven, we need to agree among ourselves before we try to get others to agree with us. And the example I'm showing here was Washington State, which tried to pass the first state carbon tax. But the proposition failed in part because the environmental community could not agree on how to spend the revenues from that tax. Proposition eight, we should use clean energy, the clean energy transition as a proxy for climate change. There's much more unanimity out there of cross party lines about clean energy than there is about climate change. Proposition nine, we've tried almost everything else to raise the status of this issue. What should we try now? I just wanted to show a couple of things. I'm going to not dwell on these very much, but there are centrist positions we can take on climate change. For example, uh, uh, agreeing to market forces as perhaps our first crack at making climate action. But this is a little bit of a formula that I put together. You can look at that later if you wish. And Proposition 10 is that civilization gives every generation some jobs to do. And this is going to be a little bit controversial, but I'm going to say that the millennials should own this topic. We all should. It could be the blue millennials, I don't know, or the boom millennials. We all should own it, all generations, but this is an especial assignment, I would say, for the millennials. They are now the largest demographic in the country, the largest potential voting bloc, and somebody needs to own this. Somebody needs to be the quarterback. So there are the propositions. Oh, I won't stop on that one. There's some evidence that the millennial giant is stirring. These are the propositions, and I'm going to leave them on the screen so that you can see them and our panelists can see them. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to these folks to have an open-ended conversation. They can say anything they want. They can tell me how stupid I am with these propositions, and then we're going to let you have a whack at it as well. So panelists, go ahead. No specific order. Go for it. Bill, if you don't mind, I think we can all agree that climate change is an existential threat. I'm going to float the prospect that if we don't deal with an effective form of governance, that that's going to be the determining factor on whether we address climate change as an existential threat. When we think of governance, we'd like to think we live in a democracy. I think of Churchill's quote that democracy is the worst form of government except, of all, except for all others. Well, I will contend that we no longer have a democracy. And when David was talking about the voter suppression and purging the rolls in Ohio, ask oneself, how did that happen? That happened because the Supreme Court justice appointment process was corrupted and perverted. That's how we ended up with Neil Gorsuch. That's how we ended up with the Supreme Court voting five to four. So if we're going to get down to the real root causes of, I think, the existential threat of climate change, I will look at the cloud that exists in Washington, D.C. 
And I say that that cloud casts a shadow over everything that is important to this country, whether it's immigration, education, woman's right to choose, the environment, and climate change. If we don't address the cloud that is casting that shadow, we will get nothing accomplished. So today we are faced collectively, not just up here in the front of the room, but those of you out here and those of you who may be seeing this live stream, what can we do? What are we going to do? Because it's going to be something, I don't have a silver bullet. I don't know if any of us does. But collectively, we have to develop something that's a response that's appropriate to the knife fight that David refers to. I don't know if you saw that clip, but just when, when the, the fellow was challenging Butch for the leadership of the Hole in the Wall gang, challenges him to a knife fight, and Butch says, let's go over the rules. And the guy who's challenging him says, what, rules in a knife fight? I want to tell you, we are in a knife fight. Imagine going out on the field with a certain number of players and a certain rules of the game, and when you're in the middle of it, you find out that the jerseys have changed. You don't even know what color the opposition is. It's not that you have four downs, now you have three. We have five. The rules of the game are being corrupted and changed, and we all have to do something about democracy, which I contend is the fundamental issue that is going to determine whether we have success in this country and beyond on whether we're going to address climate change. That's John Powers, by the way. <laughs> I haven't introduced the panelists. They're listed in your program. Um, well, I can even respond to that. So, apropos, Annie, let me say, apropos, yeah. I was supposed to make this announcement. Oh. There is a movie out there called Dark Money, apropos mm -hmm. the political corruption we see. It was a, a winner at the Sundance Film Festival, and we hope it's available on Netflix. So I just wanted to put that note in. Well worth watching, I'm told. Sorry, Annie. Oh. Well, I'm Annie LaPay, and I run legislative efforts for Vote Solar which is a national nonprofit that works at the state level to make solar more accessible and more affordable through policy um, wins at the legislatures and at the public utility commissions. And while I agree that we are up against some very stark realities, I want to share some exciting numbers that might lead to a bit more uh, optimism and hope. So 20 million. There's going to be 20 million youth who are going to be eligible to vote in 2020. If we can get them to the polls, we can win. In 2016, we lost the election to Trump. But if 4% more youth had turned out to vote in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, we would have won the election. So while our democracy might be in trouble, one of the things that gives me a lot of hope is this new youth demographic that says my top three issues are immigration, gun safety, and climate change. That is a very different reality than the demographics um, of older people. So I think that's really exciting. And if I can, just one more number that's really cents a kilowatt hour. And I just, I want. <laughs> Unsubsidized. So I want that to just blow your mind because that means that solar can compete against natural gas. We don't have to talk about climate. We can just talk about cost, and we can win. So I'm not saying we don't need to do a lot of advocacy to bolster that argument around cost, but that is a fundamental game changer that gives me so much optimism about what we're going to be able to accomplish in the next five years. Andy, to emphasize that, I don't, if anyone paid attention, but Consumers Power in Michigan, Michigan's largest utility company, announced two weeks ago that by 2040 there will be 80 percent renewable energy, largely because of innovation in solar. That was Rob Sisson of Conserve America. Anybody else? I, let me throw out a couple other numbers because I do think there's a fix. And I, David Hogg was just on Good Morning America, and I was with David Hogg and Emma Gonzalez and Cameron Kasky and these kids that are catalyzing this incredible change. And they are some of the most extraordinary human beings. And it's like they beamed in and were absolutely ready just to add water. And you know they came out. Uh, there were 102 million American citizens, 18 or over, who were eligible to vote who did not vote in 2016. 102 million. Unless we do something different, and I think the kids are moving in that direction, there's going to be 130 million that don't vote. 
So I think the fundamental question for our democracy, because we would not have Neil Gorsuch if even a tiny percentage more of Americans had voted. So how do you get them to vote? And so for the last two years, I've been trying to literally create a revolution in how we look at civics and politics. Uh, young people especially, but more and more everyone, we hate political parties, right? So young people are not even engaging with political parties in the same way, right? And we hate politicians. The people, the reason a lot of people didn't vote in 2016, even though they agreed with almost everything that Hillary Clinton stood for, was because they didn't like her personally. Right? She wasn't authentic enough, she was corrupt, she was whatever. And a, a huge percentage of people think that all politicians are corrupt. And so I say, let's throw all of that out and let's create a new paradigm. And that's what I've been working on. It's called 279 for change. 279 is the game of politics that every young person, when I talk to them, are excited to play. It is the magic number of politics. I talked a little bit about it yesterday. All you need to do is forget political parties, forget candidates, forget politics as usual, because 130 million people are gonna do that, and focus on pieces of legislation and issues that you care about. So the motto for my 279 for Change campaign is billify, don't vilify, right? <laughs> so the thing is, what we need to do for climate is pick a bill. And there is a bill. My dear friend Sheldon Whitehouse has, I'm sure many of you know him, has an incredible bill. It's called the American uh, Opportunity and Carbon Fee Act. He's got almost no support. Why? Because we're not focused on it. We're not talking about it. If everyone who cared about climate change went to their congressmen and senators who were up for re-election and said, hey, dude, guess what? I'm registered. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna vote based on one thing, just like the NRA has done for 30 years, create single issue voters. We have all the issues. If they say, I'm gonna vote based on this one bill, unless you sponsor or, or co-sponsor Sheldon Whitehouse's climate bill, right, or the Renewable Energy for America Act or by Ron Wyden, I am not going to vote for you. You've got four weeks. Boom, I want to see your name on the co-sponsor list. That's, I think, how we generate a whole different kind of excitement focused on pieces of legislation that are nonpartisan, beyond party, and have nothing to do with candidates. We hire surrogates to actually vote for those bills in the House and the Senate. Richard, I want to just jump in and emphasize how important what you just said is. I think the next step after Billify is codify. Several of is us what? codify, pass the law. Several of us worked with the Obama Party. In fact, he stood in front of Congress and said, if you don't do it, I will. They've all been destroyed because executive orders are perishable. Stroke of a pen, you know, stroke of an eraser. So we need to get this stuff into law, and that's one of the reasons I said we cannot let Congress off the hook. Thank if you. If I could just say, so 279, 218 in the House. That's a majority. There's no filibuster in the House. 60 in the Senate, because anything that's controversial will be filibustered. So you need 60, which is why Obama couldn't get a lot of stuff done, because Mitch McConnell kept filibustering everything. And then one person in the White House to sign it. You don't have to like Hillary Clinton, but she would sign a climate bill. David, you looked like you wanted to jump in. Um, I agree and disagree with, with both previous comments, but the, <laughs> the, uh, that's what panels the, the overwhelming fact, I think, for this room is, number one, we already have a majority. We've had it for a long time. And the question is, it seems to me that on one side of this Grand Canyon, you have public opinion. On the other side, you have public policy, but the bridge that connects them is broken. And that's not a simple process. So uh, I'm for political parties. They, they, are, they aggregate opinions. We have, we have no other device yet invented that really does this. There's some other things being talked about. But that, number one, is how do we repair that bridge that connects what we want as people with what we get as policy? And every political science study that shows the relationship between public opinion and public policy shows it doesn't exist. That bridge has been broken for a long time. The other thing is this. I, uh, I want to go back to this point, and I think it's, a, it's tricky to understand. I, one of the assumptions in this room has been for years that if we just get to renewable energy, ergo, we'll fix democracy. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think, again, you could have a solar-powered, hyper-efficient, sustainable, resilient, fascist society. And by fascist, I mean a society where high inequality 
militarized through the teeth. We spend $750 billion per year on military. If you add up everything, it comes to more like a trillion, all off-sites and so forth. So we, we are more, we spend more on weapons and wars than the, top, the next top 10 countries. And that includes China and Russia. The US does. So you could solar power the society, but you don't deal with inequality, inequity, income distribution, failing cities, and so forth. All those issues that Reverend William Barber in his uh, Poor People's Campaign is trying to highlight right now. Uh, it's an unfair society. The last thing I'd say is this. <clears throat> the other day on NPR, the headlines on NPR were, as I was driving to, uh, into Cleveland, were Trumpy, Trump, 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 raccoon scales, 25-story building. And <laughs> oh, by the way, Antarctica is melting a whole lot faster than anybody ever thought, five times faster than it was thought five years ago. Uh, there go virtually all American coastal cities. Have a nice day. But it was in that or Trump, 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 raccoon, uh, melting Antarctica. <laughs> you know, until we fix a media problem and the, vent, the hatred toward Hillary, uh, wasn't from Hillary totally. It was cultivated by millions of dollars of advertising and media. If Fox News, if you'd taken Fox News and Sean Hannity out, uh, and a few others, or just replaced them with other people, please, you would not have had Hillary. <laughs> if I could, I would. You, you would not have had a Hillary uh, negative vote, and she still won by nearly three million votes. Take out the, the Comey factor and the Russian factor, and that probably is more like 10 million votes. We are a majority. We have to fix how the system then processes our opinions and get public policy. Can I? Oh, Maggie, go ahead. Maggie, and then um, I'll respond too. Yeah. So I would, David's opening was I agree and disagree with the previous statements, and we, if we could have, we would have planned that framing. Um, I, my entire career, has been in policy and politics. Um, I love a good slogan, that which then gets me interested. But policy and politics are not what hold us together. They are simply mechanisms for how we actually live. What holds us together is the cultures that we operate in. And those of us, myself included, who have been involved in the world of policy and politics, and particularly climate, have missed a fundamental framework uh, an understanding about who we are as human beings. And we forget again and again that story and narrative and how we communicate with each other or don't is at the essence and underlies everything. Whether the raccoon was the first story or the last, it was the only story I remember that day. Why? Because I could relate to it and it didn't make me anything except aware of the weirdness of human life, life. And it just reflected on a much larger story and narrative. It seems after a love affair my whole career with policy and politics that one of the underlying mistakes that we've made is misunderstanding how weaving together the stories and the narratives of who we are and where we want to go and how we will do it has to presage all policy conversation, all goal orientation, all, all understanding of numbers and where they fit or don't fit. Those numbers that Annie shared with us m are, feel really good to me. Well, that's because I'm a part of that story. I've already bought that narrative. I see that future. I live that future. I embrace it. But there are a large number of people in this country that would just wonder what that meant. Mm -hmm. not have a connection to it. And so until we, we can, everything that you said, Bill, of your 10, I could argue a slight thing or agree entirely with them, but until we weave together the hero story, our story as human beings and as culture, the climate movement has spent billions of dollars on climate science, and we need every bit of it. But there's a big piece of science that we seem to walk away from and never really not only study, or, but even reflect upon. And that is the science of human behavior. We are 100% irrational. And we use numbers and statistics. And the women are nodding. <laughs> That's my next topic. <laughs> We use numbers and statistics, and we need them to shape a society 
but they don't move us one whit. We don't make decisions. I don't move money out of my pocket, nor does this gentleman with the camera here. Not one of us moves our money, our love, or our lives based on statistics and facts. Not one of us. We are driven by story, by culture, and the narratives that weave us together as communities. This is a tribal gathering. There's hardly anyone here mm -hmm. that's not largely in agreement with one another. But unless and until this narrative, our narrative, is woven into one that includes a lot more people, we will be right where we are today. Mm -hmm. We will call. <laughs> and so we take the facts, mm -hmm. we take the emotions, we take the power of the raccoon story. What, an inc what was that? What was that magical? What in the world drove that critter up those stories? Sea level rise. Exactly. <laughs> Perhaps. It's going to be a new NWF uh, yes. meme on Facebook. I mean, this could be, you could get a 279 out of that far better than you could turn to Sheldon Whitehouse and say, I can tell you right now, Sheldon Whitehouse's bill is not going to pass. Not as it is. Mm -hmm. Not as it is. Elections are revolutions. They are, but they but, have to have underneath them mm -hmm. Hillary's, there was no story. And the story that existed about her was deeply corrupted by other stories. But, but why haven't we done what you're suggesting so beautifully? We don't seem, we, it's interesting, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. We live our own lives that way, but we never seem to see that that's how we do it. We don't actually reflect upon our own human behavior. Have any of you read about Kahneman and Tversky, these two amazing Israeli men who were economists or in the early days of the Israeli mm -hmm. war? Michael Lewis does a brilliant job of telling their story, but the essence of it from the purposes of this conversation is in the early days of Israel, everything had to be about how to win, to your point, how to win. But they were economists, and they were brought out of universities in the United States and sent back to Israel to go to war. But they took the science of economics to try to figure out how to run and win a war. Well, the science of economics turned out to be behavioral economics. They birthed that whole science. And in the birthing of it, they took a look at a lot of the motivations of human beings. And they've, and they've now, the, both of them earned Nobel Prizes. There were, have been a Nobel Prize on behavioral economics for the last six or seven years running. But no one of us are talking about it. And inside the study of that human behavior explains a lot of why we are where we are today. Mm -hmm. And yet we never read it, we don't talk about it, and we don't employ it to try to drive the change we believe is the right change for the world. Maggie, I see some people squirming in their chairs well, uh, in such a provocative talk. Mm -hmm. Annie, what, you're one of the squirmers. I just, right? Yes, because I, I totally agree with you, but I would say a lot of groups are taking action to borrow from that psychology. And also just, you know, when I look at groups like Sierra Club, the largest environmental group in the nation, and the fact that over the last couple of years, equity and justice has become a central part of their mission and is becoming more so every day. Mm -hmm. Same with Vote Solar. We now have an access and equity program and it is infused into everything we do. And I think there's so many groups that are changing from being clean energy oriented groups to being clean energy and economic justice organizations. And, and this idea of you know, creating a new energy economy that is based on the same old rules, most of the groups that I'm working with, they want to throw out those rules too and work on energy democracy. That's why we care so much about rooftop solar as a way to give people access to their own energy choices, to give them control of their energy bills, um, but also because it builds a constituency of people who are more engaged. People who have gone solar are five times more likely to engage in a political process than those who haven't. So I mean, things like that matter. You need to build constituencies. There are 200, I know you're saying I'm giving you a lot of stats, but we're among the converted. So you know, there's 
a huge constituencies of solar workers that we can bring to the table and talk about economic justice and better jobs in all communities. So Definitely. I think the work is, is happening. I think people are talking about these issues and those of us you know, who are on the front lines of doing <clears throat> policy work, we are trying to learn and we're trying to get better and we're trying to get more inclusive because that is the only way we're gonna win. Rob, you wanted to say something? Yeah, uh, um, pertaining to Maggie's comments, um, I, I think there's been a lot of discussion over the last four or five years that we have turned into this tribal nation where we all have our tribes and that's, we, we live within those tribes. Um, there, there's a lot we can discuss outside of this about how to, met, uh, there's been a lot of effort. Dave, David Roberts yesterday tweeted out, out about how liberals and progressives have spent so much money and time trying to message to conservative tribes to no avail and now it's basically time to declare all out war because conservatives are never going to go that way, but that's a, that's a longer topic. But I, I, th I think this, um, along point number seven, uh, the proposition number seven, and looking at the Washington ballot initiative last time, I think there's a, mm -hmm. we have a big problem that we let the perfect get in the way of the good on, uh, on policy and advancement. And we spend more time trying to bring the per people from the other tribes to our position rather than trying to find common ground. There's so much common ground along renewable energy and, and, um, I, and I think fundamentally when you look down to it, the reason, there, there's one issue has nothing to do, well it does have something to do with environmental protection, but there's one issue that drives American politics more than any other and it's one issue where the two sides I don't believe will ever, ever come together and that's abortion. And that's why we have Neil Gorsuch. That was the single issue uh, why so many people said they were voting for Trump because they, need, they wanted that Supreme Court position because of abor the, the abortion issue. Um, and I, I was talking to Reverend Durley earlier and, and I made the comments yesterday. To me, the Democrat Party is the real pro-life party. If you care about economic, economic and environmental justice, if you care about poverty, anti-poverty and um, women's health, um, clean air, clean water, the whole list. Um, that's all pro-life to me. That's extremely strong pro-life values. But we let this one, the one, the one position that I, I think the right uses as their, their threat or their, as, as a campaign issue incessantly, get in the way of finding those com that common ground on clean air, clean water, healthy climate. Um, the, I don't know if my, my friend um, Heather is in here yet this morning from Crest, but I ran into Foster Fries, who's a running for governor as a Republican in, in Wyoming at a uh, meeting a couple weeks ago. He's like one of the big pro-life donors in the Republican Party. Um, and I grabbed him and said, hey, you, know, you could be a really good spokesman for environmental issues because I, I use the CDC language, it's kind of old now, but 300,000 to 600,000 babies every year in the United States are born with unsafe levels of mercury in their body. And that sets off a domino effect of massive taxpayer expenditures wow. on education, health care, things like that going forward. And Foster, wow. I, I've never heard that. Get me some information. I can't say I've converted him yet, but looking for the common ground is something we've, we're just not doing a good job of right now. Richard, and then I want to do a compass check. It, just real quick, there actually is a story that is out there in the public right now, and it relates to the Supreme Court. How many of you have seen the movie about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, RBG? Mm -hmm. Great. Unbelievable, right? Beautiful, beautiful film. And it talks about her love story and her story as an activist for women's rights and everything. And I brought that film down with a for a special screening for the Parkland students a few weeks ago with participant media, and they were very moved very moved. One of the Parkland kids said, you know, I, she's a goddess, she's a queen, I want to be like her, right? So we do have those stories, and then we also have the story of the Founding Fathers. This country is a story, and it's an incredibly moving story, mm -hmm. which is why I think we need to start teaching civics again. And I said something before, I said the Founding, well, we want a revolution, we have to change everything we have to throw. I said, you know what? The Founding Fathers actually, in the story of America, created that as a possibility. It's our birthright to have a revolution every two years. 
It's called an election. And in fact, this, even between now and 2020, we can change the way we actually have elections and we can throw out the electoral college. Do you guys know about that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is something which is very close to happening called the National Popular Vote Interstate <laughs> Compact. How many of you know about this? So I think the raccoon by far is the number one most important story of the last month, but this should be second. We have the ability, and we're only 98 electoral votes short, we need 270, of effectively throwing out the electoral college so that we can have an actual popular vote elect a president in 2020. So that's a reason for young people to go to the polls, not on a national level, but for their state legislators, and say, hey, vote for the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, or I won't vote for you, because Mason, I they... want my vote to count like everyone else's. The one thing before we go to David, um, I think the raccoon represents climate activists, <laughs> and the rooftop is a zero carbon economy. There you go. And that's a narrative. That's the story, <laughs> yeah. So we've heard about needing an, a, a really good, emotional, compelling new narrative. We've heard about legislation and getting some codification of, of bills passed. Can I, can I say something right before you shift? I, I, it's important to distinguish between story and narrative. A story is a story. Woven together, many stories become a narrative. And a narrative becomes a conversation and a conversation becomes a unification. It becomes a place in which we can actually agree that we're, we're in that narrative. My story might be different from your story and everyone else's, but our stories are woven together in a narrative. It's complicated and messy, not always perfect, but it fits and it goes, and we, and we travel with it. And a Ruth Bader Ginsburg story today is magnetic. It would be any time because the story itself is magnetic, but it's particularly magnetic today because it's this woman who has survived through a long period in a narrative time when the stories of women are forming into a new narrative about a 21st century power shift. So story and narrative are not the same. We say them, but we, they are very different things. One story can be magnetic. Narrative is actually a much bigger piece. We have no climate narrative. Yes. We have lots of individual stories that are not woven together just like we're not woven together in our majority. All right. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, where I was going... <laughs> where I was going with the compass check idea is that um, let's focus on what we can do that we have not yet done to push that raccoon to the rooftop. Um, David. Uh, two comments. One is, I agree with Richard on, on civic education. Only 12 states require anything like civic education. Only 12. And so we become a civically uneducated people. And I don't think our, the challenges ahead of us are, are not simple. They're huge. And so once you change something in the constitutional order, you've changed the whole order itself. And so this is going to take some very shrewd thinking about how we set the frame for the conduct, conduct of public business. And climate change can change everything. But we, we need a civically active, engaged, and smarter population than we have now. Second comment is this. Maggie's uh, wonderful comments about uh, stories and narrative, uh, I agree with. And it's very well said. Part of the difficulty we have is that the narrative has come undone. And it is fake news. It's the attack on science. Yes. Yes. Uh, for 40 years, I've hung my hat in higher education, and we're under assault because there is no fact that is now accepted as a fact without some contest. And so uh, it undermines our approach to science, to governance, and to ourselves. To develop that common narrative requires a certain level of truthfulness and a certain uh, faithfulness to fact and data and history. It requires a public that remembers its history and remembers enough to make a common narrative that fits over, over the years and takes those stories and blends it into this fabric of, of narrative that Maggie spoke of. So we, we have a problem. One other, uh, Kurt Anderson's recent book called Fantasyland is a story of how a narrative comes undone or has come undone in this culture under the uh, pressure of mostly commercial-driven fantasies. But uh, that's one of the challenges we have. Uh, Maggie said it very well, and then when we get down, we get serious about this. 
we've got to understand how th there will be multiple narratives and multiple strands in that, that fabric. But underlying all of that has to be a faithfulness to fact and data and logic and evidence. And on the other side of this, uh, not to be pejorative here, but uh, we know from Bill McKibben's work that from 1977 or perhaps even earlier, there was a systematic attempt to undermine climate science. And so we would be foolish not to pay attention to the amount of money that went into the effort to confuse and befuddle and so forth. That was huge. And you don't have to turn much of the electorate before you, number one, is already, already a majority. Get the question right, and we would have a majority in, in public policy on renewable energy and lots of other things. But there's a lot of money spent on the other side. So all the muddy footprints, I guess in my mind, go back to money and politics, that dark money that is flooding like a tsunami over the political landscape. It affects local elections in Ohio. Uh, Sherrod Brown in the U.S. Senate is up for re-election this year. He's already facing literally tens of millions of dollars of out-of-state money, much of it coming from the Koch brothers, to unseat him. And the same is true in local elections at lower levels also. So uh, our capacity to develop a common narrative and then actually act on that politically is uh, under assault. Thank you, Dave. Are we going in order or just? No, no, okay. no, no, jump, jump in. Okay, three things we can do that are new or that we can do better. Number one, register youth to vote. And if you're looking for an organization that's trying to do this and doing it well, like you did, meet my husband, Matt LaPay. <laughs> he runs the Alliance for Climate Education and Maggie's on their board as well. And honestly, I'm giving him a plug because their network is really incredible. If you look at who the youth are that they're activating to vote, 70% of them are women or identify as female, and 50% or 60% are youth of color. That's the next millennial rise. That's so exciting. Uh, number, Alliance for Climate Education. Uh, the second one is each and every one of us for the organization. And if not, it's time to go on the journey. Uh, number three, we need to elect new public utility commissioners. So for me, I really firmly believe that energy policy, 90% of it is at the state level. And we can make so much progress before we have to go back to the federal level for action. But these public utility commissioners that oversee the utilities, these are such powerful, important people, and about half of them are elected. So as a community, we need to start getting involved in those elections and electing pro-renewable folks. Three things. Thank you, Annie. John, go ahead. We'll weave the two together. I would say the terms education and action, whether it's civics education, and then how does it express itself in action? Uh, I don't know how many of you are, ever, have ever been affected by eminent domain, but mm -hmm. education is to say, what was eminent domain created for? Right? What's happening now is eminent domain is being used to run pipelines to export. So where is the public good, which is a requirement in eminent domain? What's the public good? Well, they, they take 5%, and they'll take 5% of the gas, and they'll export 95%. Okay, so if we get educated on a topic like that, what's the action we're going to take? And that's where I think the whole room needs to be involved is we have to figure out, once we get educated, which is the responsibility to educate ourselves and make it possible for others, but what action are we going to take? And this is why I'm so befuddled, is when the system can be manipulated to the point where something like eminent domain can be corrupted. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about Neil Gorsuch getting appointed? And that's, that system, be, what are we doing about voter purges? What are we doing about, if you've been following, the corruption of the census? If you, learn, if you don't know about it, learn about it, because it's the first building block in how you affect gerrymandering. We have to get educated, and then we have to figure out a meaningful narrative around how our, our governance system is being <coughs> undermined and manipulated, being used by the favored few. But we have to turn this into action. Voting is one. Getting civics education passed is another. What else can we do? And this is where we all, all, everybody here too, it's not just up in the front. What are we going to do? We have to do something. With that transition, I'm going to open it up to the floor and have you either give suggestions or ask a panel, a panelist a question, sir, in the blue shirt back there. 
think a microphone <laughs> should be coming. Here it is. Thanks, Barkley. Uh, excellent panel, guys. Thank you very much. Really interesting. Um, I want to throw out a proposition for you guys to uh, consider and, and react to. Uh, along the lines of nine, we need something new. Um, you know, Richard mentioned the founding fathers, and it seems to me that there, you know, you've, you've talked about different strains of narrative, and one is woven around justice. But there really are two main themes in American politics, going back to the founding fathers. You look at the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed with the life to be, right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That statement, that fundamental statement about what America is, ties liberty and justice together. And those are two strains, liberty plus justice equals democracy, are at the core of our society. I believe what happened in this country is that sometime after the Civil War, uh, up, up until that time, liberty and justice were almost the same thing. When you're fighting against a king for liberty, uh, and liberty and justice are the same thing. When you're fighting against slavery, liberty and justice are the same thing. But after that war against slavery was won, those two things started to divide. And we have uh, you know, one party that's much more concerned with justice, economic justice, than the other party that's much more concerned with liberty. So we've had this separation of these two main ideas. Now the proposition that you've put forward, that, that uh, David put forward today, is that <coughs> You know, this is, an, you know, the environmental and climate questions are questions of justice. You know, I'd like to suggest that if you really want to build an even bigger majority, you have to build a narrative that includes more liberty, economic liberty, right, and economic opportunity. Very high on those lists of concerns that people have. You mentioned climate change is right at the bottom. You know, jobs, the economy, economic opportunity are right at the top. Um, so if you're going to have a narrative that's based on justice, you have to understand that, you know, that's really important to you. Okay, and that, that strikes you as, as extremely important, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a narrative that really will uh, resonate mostly with people in the Democratic Party. The narrative that's going to re resonate across the aisle is one that has to do with jobs, creating, you know, breaking down barriers and cutting taxes and making energy cheaper and, you know, creating, uh, you know, economic opportunity worldwide. Um, you know, I, I put out there that one of the problems that we have with building a bigger majority is that in the last uh, 15 to 20 years, most of the, of the policies put forward for the environment were not consistent with conservative thinking. You know, you had a lot of regulation, you had uh, proposals for carbon taxes. I would love to taxes. hear some other questions. Right. We well, you also had, uh, uh, in, in any event, you know, there's, Thank you. those policies didn't, uh, you know, uh, well, I would, I would opportunities. Say, so what would you suggest? I, what I would say to that is, you know, for example, vote solar. We work in Georgia. We work in South Carolina, North Carolina. All those arguments that you're using, absolutely. You lead with where people are at and what matters to them. And that, that is absolutely happening. I really do believe that. And so we're, we're winning in state legislative campaigns in states like that. And it's a completely Republican message with Republican sponsors, Republican messengers. And so yes, that is happening at the state level. We in the back. Uh, thank you so much. This is a great panel. Um, I'd love to hear from the panelists uh, if they could address what you think about the fact that so many of the frontline communities, Black Lives Matter, the movement at Standing Rock, we could go on, the students in Florida, have really pushed a political agenda. But how do we really translate really the calling out for justice and liberation and a change in our political system, translate that into um, a narrative? that works for us on climate and also into actual votes and into actual political agendas. How do we do that? We see the frontline communities giving us direction, but how do we actually turn that into a political narrative that works at the voting level? So, thank you. Anybody? Maggie. Well, um, I wish I were here yesterday when my friend Anita and the indigenous people were speaking, and I think you were on that panel. I wasn't here. I think that 
to a certain extent, there's a, we're missing an ethical piece here. In the forming of narrative, you actually have to revisit our ethics as human beings, our ethics as, um, where, are our, where are our ethics? Because a lot of these frontline battles are around ethical violations at the core of who these individual groups are. And so the, the narrative has to be refinding our ethical core. And I think it starts with elders in an interesting way, meeting with youth. And in those two constituencies, actually creating that narrative. Because narrative doesn't happen. Um, you, can, you can push story, but narrative creates itself. Narrative is self-creating. It actually forms. The stories start to mesh. And they are beginning to do that. You're impatient. We're impatient for that narrative. But it's actually emerging, I think. And there are some missing pieces, which we can talk about offline. But I do think it's starting to come together. It's still too isolated. And it's sep some of the ways those stories are being told are pushing people away instead of inviting them in. That, David? In my perspective. The, uh, very, very quickly. <clears throat> Osprey, thanks for the question. And I think it goes to the heart of the elephant in rooms like this is where are the African American people in this room? And there are not many, never have been. We didn't, they didn't, we didn't win the Civil War and end slavery. Slavery in some ways continued to the present, and that's the Black Lives Matter movement. And that's an unequal, if you look at your net wealth and mine and compare that to the average of the African American community, they have a fraction of the wealth that white people have. That's just hard fact. That's a fraction of a fraction. It is very, very small. So you say Black Lives Matter, well, really they don't. Not in a way that white lives have mattered. And that is, I think, the Second Amendment is a very good book recently. I've forgotten the author's name. But it, it traces the Second Amendment back to the need to control slave uprisings. And so right at the start of that Second Amendment was a need to control uppity people that might rebel. And <clears throat> so <clears throat> excuse me, the, the issue for me is if we're going to deal with this, then the solar movement and the democracy movement and all that has got to build a big tent. And we've got to ask some very hard questions. And the fact of the matter is we have never been as wealthy as we thought we were. We pushed a bow wave of debt off into the future. And a good bit of that regulatory state was created to try to balance that, uh, that inequity that was built into the system. So if prices told the truth, and you included all the prices of industrial development and so forth. Last week I happened to be on an old southern uh, rice plantation in South Carolina. And it took slaves uh, eight to nine years to clean off a 100-acre field of cypress trees. It would be massive trees with axes. Uh, the wealth that they created in what was then the wealthiest county in the United States never got into black hands. To this day, we haven't figured out that we, we created a thing that spilled into generation after generation. So uh, until, we, until we confront this, and it's uncomfortable, there's some progress here and there, but overall the numbers are that African American people in this society have a fraction of a fraction of the wealth that people like you and I do, which explains why they're, they're not here. So this has got to be a big movement. I would love to see our day link up with uh, Reverend William Barber's uh, uh, poverty campaign. Mm -hmm. I, would love to, I would love to see us have a, an our day event in Montgomery, Alabama uh, with Brian Stevenson's Equal Justice Initiative. Uh, let's, let's begin to build that larger tent, and it, it, it's going to be building what Maggie, again, so well describes as this narrative. We're in this together, but until we confront the fact that our prices haven't told the truth, we have never been nearly as wealthy as we thought ourselves to be. We, our prices were basically lies, and lies about a lot of the wealth that's accumulated in the country. And now that we're coming up into this climate change era when that's going to be the real stress test. And I, I don't think that we're alone in knowing that, but that, that's going to be real, 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 real. Richard, real quick, real, and this, real. We're, we have seven minutes left before they take away our hotel rooms, so we need <laughs> everyone to be concise here and there. Real, real Go quick. ahead, Richard. Here's a narrative or a story or a nightmare that's going to affect Black, Live, Black Lives Matter and everything that we are looking to do in this room and fighting for. And that is if Ruth Bader Ginsburg or Stephen Breyer retires or dies <clears throat> during the sec or between now and the end of the Trump administration because the, s the filibuster for Supreme Court justices was nuked by the Republicans, mm -hmm. we're going to get a 30-year-old 
far right wing person who is going to be the swing vote for every single thing that anyone in this room cares about, especially young people mm -hmm. and black people and people who care about the environment. There is only one way to stop this, and I wrote a civics book for the midterms. It's called Civics 2.018, Civics for the 2018 Midterms. And the only way to stop it is to vote for Sherrod Brown and to vote for Democrats in Senate seats for us to take back the Senate so that it is Chuck Schumer and not Mitch McConnell who can go to Donald Trump and say, no, we're not going to allow this person on the court. That is our only chance for a generation. All right, Richard, the way this is working is that I'm not picking people. The microphone people are picking people. So uh, take out your $10 bills and, <laughs> and bribe a microphone person okay. to come to you. This man over what, here has got to back. Gotta let people know. Oh, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Let's, let's talk. All right. Okay, yeah, let's balance off the side, microphone people. Yes, sir, way in the back. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, building on what Maggie said, um, uh, at the university level, I was a professor of decision science for 10 years, and I was appalled at the critical thinking capabilities that are developing in the country. They're terrible. We used to be able to think critically as a nation, and if you can't think critically, you're going to believe the spin that's sent towards you. So whether it be at the political level or, quite frankly, very important for the next generation, we need to teach them the basic critical thinking like we learned years ago. If we can get that back into our fabric, then a lot of this stuff is going to go away because nobody's going to buy it. Thank you. Thank you. Who else has a microphone? Let's, uh... Okay. Oh, are you the microphone person or are you pointing to someone? Okay, go. The microphone person. Yes. Ma'am, right in the front here with right your here blue shirt. <laughs> yeah, I'm blind up here. I'm sorry, folks, but I'm trying to see you. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for a great panel. My question has to do with Propositions 7 and 10. I am a millennial. I'm 22 years old. And um, I feel that, you know, I agree that we have to agree within our movement, but how we... Oh, yeah. No, I have to put my glasses on to see that. Yeah, so, you know, we, oh. yeah, we have to agree before we persuade others to disagree, and then the, the millennial issue. So I agree that we have to agree, but how we reach that agreement matters. In Washington, the carbon tax proposal failed because one group drowned out the voices of another. And I don't think that that's the way <laughs> that we should go about agreement. So when we think about the people that are leading this movement, young people, folks in frontline communities, rural communities, how do we uplift their voices? How do we come to this sort of agreement um, you know, without drowning out each other's voices? How do we actually build consensus and come together as a climate movement? Thanks. I'm so glad I called on you. I'm going to call on you again um, a little later. Who has a microphone now? Well, can I just respond to that? Both. Just yeah, 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 I'm sorry. Really quickly. And I, I think... No, I, that's how we do that. <laughs> you're right on. I think we don't need to dictate for people why they're interested in clean energy action. And we don't need to have egos in this and say, well, we need to be involved. Sometimes you need to step back and let other people lead. I, I think it's about being a good coalition builder. And we need more people in the movement that take that skill and hold it up above others. Um, but I feel like that's, that's happening. And maybe it's going to be the 70% women you know, in the youth movement that are coming up that are going to be the next generation of leaders. But that skill of collaboration-based leadership, it's, I, I feel it in the circles that I'm in. And hopefully, it's going to happen more and more. All right, I can take one more question. We are almost at the two-minute mark, and then I want to ask you all to do something. Yes, ma'am. So my name is Monica Medina, and I'm here because I started an environmental newsletter called Our Daily Planet. So I'm actually here covering the uh, whole conference. But I did start this environmental newsletter after a career in government because of all the things that you've said, because we don't have a common narrative, because we aren't telling enough stories, because the stories aren't breaking through, because millennials don't have a voice, so my partner is a millennial. Um, and we need to c get more combined. We need that 
power of all of us in the room, and so telling those stories to as many people as I can is what I'm trying to do. But one of the things I've found is that climate is often one of those wedge issues that sometimes turns off people. So we've tried to tell the climate story through other types of <coughs> narratives, like health. Health is a huge important part of the climate story. We tell one climate story a day, but we probably tell five a day just because they um, have a climate impact or they're, they're, um, you know, they, they're shaped by climate, but we, they're, it's a bigger story than even just the climate movement. Are you all seeing that? And are you trying to incorporate some of these other messages? The, the job story is a great one on clean energy, and that, you know, you could you could just talk about that and be very effective, or these health narratives. I, I think the answer is yes, we all yeah, do see yeah. that, and there's a lot of that translation going on. We have 44 seconds. I'm going to ask you just to yell out what you think you take away from this uh, panel. Excuse me, Bill. I want to have the last word here. This is the producer's prerogative. I want to, I want to uh, note. Do I get extra time? Maybe. I want to note something here. This is, this is an observation and a question. I noticed that there's five white men and two women up there. And when we're talking about democracy, and we're talking about disenfranchised elements of our society, and that women constitute half of the U.S. population, can we address that issue before we close this panel on democracy? You're going to get that issue. What's going to happen in the fall? Maggie's Thank going to address that in the next well, segment. Well, hey, Chip. I'm, I'm, I'm on um, the board of a uh, conservation or environmental group in Michigan, and we talk about diversity all the time, particularly recruiting um, people from the Detroit and Flint communities to our board. But I always like to point out that, and I'm just, I'm going to make an assumption here, but I'm probably the only right of center person on this thing, too. So there's another type of diversity we need to work on as well. All right, Chip, have the final word. Um, we are done. Thank you all for listening, and thank you for these guys. It's been great. Well, I, I just want to say thank you to my boss, Adam Browning, who looked at that panel and said, oh, these are all white men. I'm going to step off and let Annie come talk in my place. Yep.